Well, I've changed my mind, and I think he should try for 16 years and the record. I want to thank uh, the Secretary. I want to thank all of you. Uh, there are uh, a few minutes in which I have been asked uh, to uh, report on what I think we heard. I believe I've been asked to do this because I am the chair of the roundtable and also because I am a lawyer, uh, I have insurance, and I'm not seeking tenure anywhere. So I can try now uh, to tell you uh, what at least I believe I heard to inform this roundtable and perhaps others going forward. We began with Captain Heidi Blank, confirming that we are still in the midst of an epidemic. You know the numbers, and you know how long they have been the numbers. Two-thirds of all adults overweight, one-third of all adults who now have obesity, 82.7 million Americans. And you know that the prevalence is not uniform, and improvements for some ages and some groups provide encouragement, but little comfort. The second panel that Bill Dietz convened here reminded us how recently the epidemic was discovered and at the same time how long ago it was discovered and how surprised we were when it was discovered. Dr. Satcher made clear that early on we believed the cure would be multifactorial and multisectoral. In fact, that very first report in advance of all of the research that so much of us have done subsequently, in fact, said exactly that 15 years ago. But we did not know how long it would take to get the intention of the nation or to get the nation to act. Dr. Copeland was very clear in saying, and this is a paraphrase but almost a direct quote, it was much more complex than we knew, it was much more complex than any other epidemic much more complex than tobacco, and to him, and now this is a direct quote, quote, it's still early in its course. Dr. Satcher, Copeland, and Murthy made clear that it is imperative to stay the course if indeed we want to end the epidemic. The Surgeon General said the challenge is to make clear the relevance to each person, to continue to show and share progress with each person, to make sure everyone knows what they can and perhaps what they must do. Coordination at all levels and in all sectors, a recurring theme throughout the presentations today, investment in policies and practices that work from sidewalks to schoolrooms, never losing sight of the social determinants, a matter about which all three agreed on that panel and I think again a recurring theme throughout, never losing sight of the disparities as well. Dr. Satcher was especially clear in saying, I didn't think I talked much about race. I do think I talked about the disparities in all social determinants, including race. The Surgeon General said health equity is a policy priority and a value, close quote. For the long term, to avoid fatigue, diversion, and or I might say failure, I heard more science, more stamina, more hard, tough conversations, to quote the Surgeon General, shifting demand and aligning incentives. And among those hard, tough conversations in early care and education, Debbie Chang made clear in her very useful chronology, a chronology I think worth, worth uh, us all looking at again, there are best bets for practice, best bets for training, best bets for technical assistance, bet, best bets for self-assessment, and improvement, but the stark issues remain that moving to scale, that racing to equity, the title of a book, but clearly a mission statement as well, funding limitations for staff and for programs has delayed the move from studies and research to sustainable practice. We don't have, Chris would say, the collection of resources we need to do that thing. In business, many may have been pleased to hear some may have heard for the first time of a new awareness of corporate social impact on health and well-being. It is changing dramatically. I think the message from all panelists was right now. CEOs and boards hearing from consumers and employees about the need for change, about the importance of change to recruitment and retention of employees, especially millennial employees, a transformative effect on the workforce, but also in the success of the business going forward, a culture shift in business bridging the gap between profit 
and purpose. With consumer demand shifting, the business case can be made for change. That, I think, is a direct quote. And that new, more hard, tough conversations likely will need to follow. Because going forward, there are opportunities for employers to focus on the healthy workforce and communities, but that may require some incentives. Some incentives from local governments, some incentives from state governments, perhaps other incentives, a desire to continue the national momentum and seeing the work through. Again, more new, perhaps, in the Surgeon General's phrase, hard, tough conversations to follow. In physical activity, our children are still among the least active in the world. Since 2008, the trends are improving for reasons we do not understand, Jim Salas would say. I just noted there was actually a new first lady that came into office in 2008, but I think there is no data to support that conclusion, and so I simply mention it as a fact in that context of Jim asking if I had any ideas. What can we do? Well, a new national plan right now, and Russ was involved in that plan, a blueprint, but it's new, and we start anew. And there are physical activity interventions that work, quote, but few are being widely implemented. They are, quote, challenging and costly. Chris says, where schools add a portfolio of programs and add community support, there is reason to foresee success. But Jim's point, implementation is challenging and can be costly. Cole's six key strategies are evidence-based and doable, and they're not just his, but obviously the ones that he was mentioning in his presentation today as an outcome here of the Institute of Medicine. Evidence-based and doable, including uh, physical uh, uh, at PE as a core subject. Challenging and costly, but federal help now available that may encourage the move, how to sustain for life, especially in the face of injury and pain, a challenge, perhaps costly. Walking with friends. Actually, I was thinking about uh, the Surgeon General's comment earlier. You might even call it walking with friends and walking with enemies. Certainly walking with employees would be another way to think about it. Um, they'll have to be your friends, better if they were at least at the end, but the training and technical assistance is missing for implementation. As the Surgeon General said and Arnell Hinkle affirmed, we need to understand how and why this applies to me, and what can I do. We need more champions, we need more demand, uh, more than one, certainly perhaps as many as 12 for one program, and then champions and leaders and advocates across the nation in all of those communities and states and regions and rural areas, local leadership inside and outside of the government. Implementation and translation is a critical challenge, especially at the middle school and the high school level, especially now. And for treatment challenges of all the gaps, I think, that were identified, at least for me today, most striking in what we heard here about treatment, 17,600,000 Americans with severe obesity, and those numbers that we had quadrupled the number of board-certified practitioners in the area and now had 1,600, and that just meant there was one person available with that training and certification for 11,000 potential patients. 86 million Americans with pre-diabetic condition, one major program, if expanded to serve them all, would only need to be expanded by 11,000 percent. The gaps between obesity treatment guidelines and actual treatment, the gaps in acceptance of treatment recommendations, uh, the gaps in insurance for drug interventions, and the gaps for insurance in the case of less severe obesity surgery. Disparities in treatment, both in the results uh, between, uh, and, uh, between racial and other groups, which we do not understand. New research is clearly required and advocated for studying these disparities and others in the urban and rural and other groups. More training, the number again stunning for me, 25 percent only of doctors saying, I think maybe I have enough training to talk to my own patient about the issue that is presenting to me right now. The flip, 75 percent do not. Payment systems appear misaligned in this area. 80, 90, 80 to 90 percent, I think Don said, of the dollars are directed to 10 percent of the impact. Integrated approach, right care to the right people, more attention to social programs, very clear recommendation, a need for common definitions and competencies, no information as to how those things would occur or when. In terms of philanthropy, I will say, uh, it was not, David, a bad benediction, in fact, the whole panel. 
We heard Barbara say, I'm in it. I'm in it for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. Robert Wood Johnson said basically the same. Marion, I think with her conclusion, it's a social movement that she's going to begin. That's certainly the rest of her life she's in it, and it could be several lifetimes after that. And David was very clear that this new connection and understanding of the way in which this combines with the other interests, both of his foundation and others, makes him believe that not only his, but also others will want to continue to be supportive and involved in the process going forward in the work that we're doing and gives us all, I think, hope and encouragement, as I would argue Secretary Vilsack did as well. I can't thank him enough uh, or, uh, or the, uh, the National Academies for hosting him here this afternoon. He took you through WIC. He took you through transformation. I, too, hadn't understood the food pyramid since the third grade I'd tried. Not as hard as him. I didn't study the food pyramid at Harvard the way he did. But I can tell you that it's clear to me that it, perhaps it's the fact that he's had eight years of practice almost. But in fact, he understands it. He gets it. I don't think there's an issue that we have raised in our conversations, whether it was accelerating progress or here in the round table, that was not a piece of his thinking and at least a piece of what the department was on the way of addressing, not to curing, not to solving. I thought there was also a balance and understanding about the long haul and the need to stay the course in a wide range of areas, including a better understanding about what both pilots need to play out and what needs to occur at the street level, at the neighborhood level, at the store level, at the regional level, and then ultimately at the national level. So my conclusion at the end uh, is there is every reason, not just to be hopeful, but to be optimistic, that the three years this roundtable has spent together has allowed us to see a wide range of policy challenges, needs, once again today, no question about it, but at the same time, a country that has a large number of people, many of this in, in this room, who understand what needs to be done and increasingly are closer to knowing how to do it. And for that reason, I'm optimistic, hopeful, and encouraged by the time that we will spend together uh, as a roundtable in the years ahead. We also know it's for the long haul, and because all of you are committed and recommitted in some cases here again today, uh, we will work together for as long as it takes, because at the end of the day, speaking at least for me, we should end the obesity epidemic. And I hope and believe that this roundtable will be a part of that solution. Thank you all very, very much. We stand adjourned.